So my brother from New Jersey flew over with me last night just to do that. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, yes, exactly. He's not just an auditor, he's an all-around good guy. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. A couple things strike me just as we get started. One is the tremendous progress that Leslie described about Life Science Washington. So this is the first time I've attended the event. I know it's been a, uh, an annual, very, very important event for the life cycle uh, ecosystem in Washington. But Leslie, congratulations on all the great work. I think we should applause the group again for what you've done. I also need to give a shout out to table three, four, and five, because these are my colleagues from Juno and Celgene. Uh, thank you for showing up early this morning. Great to see you. Uh, in particular, the leadership of our Immuno-Oncology Center of Excellence, which is located in Seattle. Part of that is Juno, obviously part of that is Celgene, and together, uh, I'll talk about how that represents our interests here in the local region, but globally. So Ann Lee, Ann's right here, and then Terry Foy. Where's Terry? The Terry's right here on table four, so thanks for being here this morning, and so many of my other great colleagues. Um, when I got the invitation letter to join you from Leslie, it read in part that I had a lot of flexibility about what to say. You don't know me, that's a dangerous thing. Uh, who knows what I might say, but you remember the letter. It also then said, would you be willing to talk about the extraordinary transformation that's happening in the cancer field? Sure. And would you also then talk about how all of that is affecting so many stakeholders, from politicians, policymakers, the financial toxicity that comes from a lot of what it is that happens in this ecosystem today, particularly in our focus on patients. Would I do that? And I, absolutely, I'm, I'm thrilled to do that. But I thought the way to do that today was to try in this room of innovators to suggest what's possible, to answer the question what's possible with all of you. Everyone in the room on the back of a Paul Allen story can put life into such context. The first thing is, why do we celebrate Paul Allen? Well, he's a billionaire. So our pop culture puts us in a position where we celebrate success like that. He's a technology entrepreneur with Bill Gates, almost mythological in terms of how Microsoft was discovered, developed, and has created so much value for so many people all over the world. He's a rock star. I don't know if you knew, Paul Allen's a great guitar player. My son's a guitar player, and he looks up to Paul Allen. He called me the day he passed away, and I thought, oh, here's my son. He's finally figuring out what healthcare is all about and what Hodgkin's lymphoma is. And he said, you know, he's a great rock star, and I'm going to miss his art. He plays with Eric Clapton. Like, okay, that makes sense. There's another reason to love Paul Allen. But why is it that when someone like Paul Allen passes away, we call it out? In Seattle, it makes perfect sense. But the whole world paused for a second and said, Paul Allen passed away. And he passed away at 65 of Hodgkin's lymphoma. What's with that? How does that happen? So I'm going to talk about the what's possible because I think Paul Allen's life as a tech entrepreneur is what we're all trying to in some way capture, but do it in our way in how we think about innovation. So from a housekeeping point of view, I also want to let you know there's nothing more exciting than starting out a day in a room full of innovators and entrepreneurs. So I think all of you should give all of yourselves a round of applause for being great medical entrepreneurs. Thank you. So I thank Leslie and I thank Life, Sci Life Science Washington for the opportunity to be here today. To start out and answer the question what's possible, I thought maybe I should not take for granted that you know a lot about Celgene and the company that I represent. But I do think it is, again, what all of us would like to participate in while we work through this vi virtuous cycle of, of, of value from innovation, discovery, development, and then, of course, can all of us become viable companies one day with big, successful economic profiles? So let me, let me just take you back to why I joined Celgene and see if it resonates with how you think about what you're trying to do today and for the next many years. I had been in the industry for a long time. My children, three of them, were in high school. 
uh, I got a phone call from a recruiter in New Jersey who said, hey, Celgene's looking for a head of their cancer business. It's a very small company, 300 people. And by the way, they have a drug called thalidomide. Ring a bell? Everybody remember thalidomide? I thought, yeah, I know all about that. I don't think that's going to attract me very well. Uh, but then I did some reading and I found out that analogs of thalidomide were in development for diseases like multiple myeloma, myelodysplastic syndromes, and certain leukemias. And I thought, maybe I should look into this a little bit more. It's a startup. I was getting a little bit long in my career, about 20 years in, and I thought, this might be the startup that I want to think about. It's in New Jersey. It's my backyard. Why not? So I joined in 2004. In 2005, we launched a product called Revlimid for multiple myeloma. The median survival for multiple myeloma in 2005 with autologous bone marrow transplant and all in median survival for all patients was around about three years, 2005. Today, because of some nine to 10 molecules and antibodies that have been approved for this disease, median survival is greater than 10 years. And some people think it's not estimable because it's a disease of elderly people. So if you get myeloma at 70 and you can be effectively treated for another 10 to 15 years, you die from old age, not from an incurable blood cancer. That's happened since 2005. What else happened? In 2004, when I joined, Celgene had 200 employees. It had its 17th year in a row of net operating losses. I don't have to tell anybody in the room who is a startup what that means. It's a very difficult cycle year after year to raise money and try to find yourself in a position to get up in the morning and keep pushing forward as hard as you can to be able to someday become profitable. Because like it or not, these are businesses. If you don't generate cash, if you don't make a profit, you will go out of business. It's just a question of time, not if. So 2004, we launch our products. Revenues are in the $200 million range. And then in 2010, that number grew to $4 billion. We also went from a zip code in New Jersey, Warren, to 70 countries around the world and close to 4,000 employees. Today, yesterday, we had our third quarter earnings call with the street. You wouldn't know it from our share price, but I'll talk about that another time. Um, we had a record quarter. We guided to a beaten raise on the top line of better than $15 billion and earnings per share that are the envy of biopharma in terms of growth profile. We have 8,600 employees around the world, and we're distributing and selling eight different products, seven of them for cancer, one for an immunologic condition called psoriasis and uh, complications of it, arthritis. So what's possible? What's possible that in 15 years, not only have we done that, but we've treated over a million patients with our innovative therapies and have changed median survival for myeloma, lymphoma, and increasingly because of our partnership with Juno as part of our approach to CAR-T therapy, we will do the same thing for a form of leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So from thalidomide, the most vilified drug in the history of mankind, and it should be, to where we are today is what's possible for any company. This shouldn't be isolated, and here's the other reason why as Leslie points out today. Technology is advancing so much so that what's happening now is you can literally start a biotech in your garage. Think Paul Allen, think Steve Jobs, think when the computer did not exist but they created it. Now we have teenagers in high schools around the world who through computer and computational biology uh, abilities, uh, coding, et cetera, they're able through artificial intelligence and from their, their own uh, computer in their homes, talk about and think about correlating prognostic predictive features from literature that 10 years ago would have been impossible even for a company like Celgene. And today people can do it from their home. We are accelerating at a pace that has never existed before. You know that, but Leslie talked about some examples of some successes that come out of Seattle, Seattle Genetics, 
and what they're doing in the lymphoma world. Juno Therapeutics and CAR-T. 10 years ago, the notion that we could extract through apheresis tumor cells from a host, genetically modify then the environment of that macro environment of a patient's own plasma with tumor cells, then return them to that patient after they've been expanded with T cells and other immune enhanced cells to kill, uh, be directed to a certain antigen target, CD19 in this case, no one would have dreamed it 10 years ago. 10 years ago, no one could have looked at the literature and said, there's a thing called PD-1, PD-L1, the so-called checkpoint inhibitors in oncology. If you read Journal of Clinical Oncology, read New England Journal of Medicine, read any journals, and it would be very difficult to find any references to T cell checkpoint inhibitors and solid tumors just 10 years ago. What's happened in the last five? Patients with non-small cell lung cancer are living longer and better than ever on the back of immunotherapy. I'll give you the story of Jimmy Carter. If you haven't heard it, you should hear about what's possible with immunotherapy. Jimmy Carter, our former president, was diagnosed with metastatic melanoma. He had a lesion to his brain. The people in the room who are physicians or who know the space know that is a death sentence. When you're diagnosed with melanoma, it's already difficult. But thank you, Bristol Myers Squibb, with Yervoy, Obdivo, et cetera. But Jimmy Carter was diagnosed where the brain, his lesion had uh, metastasized to his brain. That is death within weeks not years. He got on the investigational study of Obdivo early on, and his lesion disappeared. Now, think about that. The problem with brain cancer, brain metastases, is you can't get drugs through the blood-brain barrier. So this drug did what? It trained his immune system to recognize metastatic melanoma and, in fact, cure him. So where does public policy intersect with innovation? In Georgia, there's the Jimmy Carter law, which says that if you have a cancer, like he did, you get access to checkpoint inhibitors regardless of your ability to afford them. That's a pretty good thing. That's a great story. First, of innovation. Second, of a celebrity. And third, how it changed an entire state and how they think about creating access to therapies like, in this case, Obdivo. What's possible? It's pretty amazing. Think about my own company. In the window that we talked about on the back of a drug for myeloma, which is a rare orphan disease, supported by public policy and tax credits that have existed at the national level, federal level, for a long time, where if you're doing certain kinds of research, you're able to get write-offs and other considerations that, if you take advantage of it, could be quite profound, and of course, Celgene did that. But what did we do with some success? We created a partnership model that has become largely the envy of the in industry. All the products that we have in our pipeline now that form our next wave of innovation are partnered through deals we've done wherever science took us. We have a purpose statement like you do, the mission statement for Life Science Washington, which is to change the course of human health through bold pursuits in science. If you're going to live up to that purpose and whatever you do and what your organization does, that means you better be chasing it down every day, regardless of where it is. And that'll bring me to Seattle and Juneau in just a minute. Last night in New York City, the Pre-Gallion Awards were held. I'm not sure if everyone in the room knows what the Pre-Gallion Award is, but it is the most prestigious award for new molecules, new medicines, granted on the back of, of probably the most famous uh, researcher, at least historically, uh, Gallion, in the context of pharmacology and science. Our partner, Agios, out of Cambridge in Boston, 
uh, out of 19 nominations, along with Celgene, won the award for a drug called Idifa. This is our third win of the Pregallion Award. So why do we celebrate? Here's what's possible. Nine years ago, Agios was a startup on a piece of paper. We met some venture capital people who said, hey, these guys are studying cancer metabolism. And by the way, there's a guy named David Schenkine who's starting it up, and Ann Lee, a Terry Foy, anyone in the room who is looking to build something, this is what's possible. So he did a lot of work at Genentech. We knew him well. I knew him well from a previous life. And we thought, we're going to be early investors in Agios. Agios then, within seven years working with us, identifies a very specific mutation, genetic driver of acute myeloid leukemia, IDH1 and 2. IDFA is a drug that targets the IDH2 mutation in subsets of AML. What's possible? Seven years ago, we didn't know that IDH2 and 1 were specific mutation drivers for AML. Now we do. Seven years ago, we didn't even have the chemical matter that became IDFA. Now it's a marketed product. Seven years ago, if you had that subset of AML, you had weeks to live. Now I've met people, and on the cover of, of our annual report for last year is a gentleman by the name, I'll just use his first name, Ralph, who is in deep remission with a pill a day because the drug is attacking that mutation driver and is keeping him in remission with a pill a day. Nothing else. Seven years ago, Ralph would be dead because we didn't have the product. That's what's possible. Leslie talked about other therapies. At ESMO a week ago, our product, Abraxane, in combination with checkpoint inhibitors, improved for the first time ever in a randomized phase three trial in combination with a checkpoint inhibitor from Roche, T-centric, survival in women with a subset of metastatic breast cancer called triple negative disease. If you know breast cancer, you know that's the difficult one. If you're triple negative, it means you don't really respond and can't be treated with most of the important therapies, including Herceptin. Now, women have an updated opportunity to be able to live longer and better with a very terrible form of the disease. We've been chasing down science, I have, all of you probably have, for a long time. But you are living now, and we are coming together today in a city, a region, that I'll just tell you, after we closed the Juno transaction, I described it like this to Governor Ensley. We had a phone call about Celgene and, and what was happening with Juno. And as I joked with him a little bit, I said two, a couple things. One, what our goal, and I will tell you this, uh, my colleagues know this, what Celgene's goal in Seattle is to make it as well known a region and city for Boeing, Amazon, Microsoft, but also for immuno-oncology. I was quite specific with the governor that it shouldn't, in my mind, be a, an incubator for all biotech. Our view, and by the way, we have 1,000 employees now in the Seattle, greater Seattle area, is to make it our center of excellence worldwide for immuno-oncology. That is all, all things immune-related, T-cell biologically-related science for the treatment of cancer. So when you think about where we are, we had already decided in 2015 to partner with Juno because we were following science. We invested a billion dollars into Juno in 2015. It was a strategic partnership. We were looking for a long range opportunity in the field of CAR-T. Celgene was part of the bidding process for what was the University of Pennsylvania program in the Carl June CD19 directed program. We lost out to Novartis, but I would argue this is what serendipity is all about. Because we lost out, we're in a much better place. The Juno integration, the Juno transaction has put us in a position 
to have a pipeline, not just a product. To have a group of scientists who are transforming not just this first generation, but thinking about next generation. To have a group that already had manufacturing in place that we are now optimizing and building next generation around. What's possible? We were following science and we found Juno. Now we're one company trying to take forward curative intent. Here's the problem in cancer today. The incidence of cancer isn't really changing that much. Certain diseases, yes. The problem today is we're doing so well at acutely treating the disease surgically through radiation, even, yes, chemotherapy, the way we thought about it historically. But with immuno-oncology now, the whole shift is going from incidence to prevalence. Quality of life, living in Washington State, living in Seattle, People think about quality of life. Most people today think about quality of life around cancer and wonder, how do I afford the medicines that will keep me alive? Because they will. But what do I do to solve for that? So all of us working together not only have to be thinking about the acute diagnostic and intervention approach to save somebody's life, which is becoming, ironically, easier. But now the shift to chronic control of cancer, and then yes, what happens when over time those medicines consume so much of what an individual or what society is thinking about with respect to healthcare. We can't just solve for the biologic issue. We have to be solving holistically for what we're in fact achieving. We're not dealing with that well enough. I would argue that that's a cause that Life Science Washington could be really rallying around real world evidence, the kinds of things we need to relieve, we need to do to relieve financial toxicity. But what a great problem to have. You don't worry about financial toxicity if you're not dealing with saving somebody's life. Why CAR T? We think we can cure people with cancer. Cell gene is existing to not incrementally try to do well, but to step up and look for subsets. Brad and I talked about homogeneity earlier uh, this morning, where you define the best therapeutic outcome. You wanna know why cancer therapy costs so much? It's not because of the unit cost of the medicine, it's because we still treat empirically across huge heterogeneous groups of patients. And then we hope to find 30% or 40% who might benefit, and then we celebrate. But the 60% who didn't benefit, what happens to them? The system is paying for all that, but getting no real benefit. And I don't have to tell you about the, the toll on families. So we're extremely focused on this, and I would put it a call to action, that it's about the quality of life of the patients we're helping, as well as defining who should get treated, and unfortunately, who probably should not get treated. With CAR-T therapy, with our Juno partnership, that's not a question. That's not a question. We know these patients have the cell surface marker. We know that when they get back the product, they should be a responder. The issue is, can you give it back therapeutically and manage the toxicity? When you destroy tumors like that, you create a lot of toxic uh, burden on the patient. So that balance is really, really important. And again, our Juno colleagues have gone a long way to taking care of that. Why Seattle? Because the Fred Hutch is something that I grew up knowing is the center of the universe when it comes to bone marrow transplant, hematology, and how we think about excellence in science. Reputation matters, and it matters a lot. Today, we have, at any one point in time, 30 to 40 studies that involve clinical trial sites in the state of Washington. Since I joined Celgene, something in the range of 150 trials that we've done in our portfolio of cancer drugs have flowed through sites in this great region, and largely because of the academic-public partnership. More of that needs to be talked about. There is an entire ecosystem of clinical trials being done here in Washington, and in my opinion, a lot more could be done. So think about the patient, the academic center, what you're doing, and how to get into that environment where very virtuously 
your medicine is being tested locally, and of course then it's recognized globally. So we come full circle to innovation. And as I close, I just want to once again remind you that this cycle of innovation that we're on, that it is possible and that it does work. Leading Celgene, I'm living proof that risk takers, entrepreneurs, people who look to actually change human health can produce medical miracles and literally change the course of people's lives. The economic benefit Leslie talked about a lot. I'll just tell you at Celgene, we easily have had a thousand people who become millionaires on the back of the economic success of the company. We have an entrepreneurial culture where everyone's a shareholder, which means when we do well, they do well. When we don't do well, obviously, if you're a shareholder, you don't do as well. So I think this what's possible story is what I hope you'll take back today and recognize it's worth it. It is absolutely worth it. I'll close with two anecdotes that come from our Juno colleagues. Uh, two people, one Nick, one Kate. Nick is a 30-some-year-old firefighter who ended up with lymphoma, ended up finding his way to a CAR-T therapy study that was done by Juno in advance of our decision to acquire. Nick had failed all of the existing therapies known. He really was facing his mortality. And he came on the study and watched his tumors disappear within one treatment. Kate is a marathon runner. We heard about you know, marathon runners today and you don't associate 31-year-old uh, people who are marathon runners with cancer that threatens their lives. Kate also got on the Juno trial, and I'm sure, because I've seen some of the video, some of my colleagues here probably know who Kate is personally. She is also in complete remission. The last patient I'll tell you about is someone I've gotten to know very well. Her name is Sheree, Sheree Reniker. Sheree is 55 years old. She's a mother, an entrepreneur. She's a free spirit yoga, all of that, so really uh, lights up the room. She has multiple myeloma, and over a seven-year period had 13 lines of therapy, 13 different lines of therapy. The best response she ever achieved was a partial response. And if you know anything about cancer, you know if all you do is keep getting PRs, you're not gonna do very well over time. She was so sick that she could not actually take a plane from Houston, where she lives, to Nashville, Tennessee, where the trial for one of our other CAR-T therapies is being conducted. So her family rented a van, put a bed mattress in the back of it so she could lay down for the 14-hour ride from Houston to Nashville on the hope that she might qualify for the clinical trial. Turns out she did. And after one cycle of another approach to CAR-T that we have, she's in complete remission and now is speaking regularly on, the, on behalf of innovators and what it means to keep looking at, in fact, cure. So I started with what's possible, I'll end with what's possible. Somebody in this room, maybe many of you in this room, will create the next cell gene, and I can't wait to come back and celebrate when we do. Leslie, thank you again for the opportunity to be here with you today. Welcome, it's so great to meet so many people and be here to my Celgene colleagues and especially leading the, the, the Juno team here today. Thank you, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. Thank you.